listening to Historical AF, or if you cuss like we do, Historical As Fuck. I'm your basic librarian, Ashley. And I am your ex-librarian historian, Kina. We're here to deliver the funny, weird, spooky, morbid, and random historical nuggets you never knew you needed. (laughs) Love it. (laughs) Welcome. Welcome to episode 14. Yes. Wow, we are like moving on up. Yeah, we are. And we got some news for you guys. We are going to be slightly, ever so slightly, changing the format of our show. (laughs) We are going to split our themes up into two weeks so that we can do more research and talk a lot without it being five hours long. Yes, yes, I think. Everyone will appreciate that so much better. We will appreciate that so much better. But yeah, so this week we will do three stories about our topic, which this week is libraries. And then next week we will do three more stories about libraries. Yeah, so we'll keep the spooky, morbid, random and all that. We're just going to split it three and three. So that way (laughs) we don't have episodes like the last two that are like almost three hours. (laughs) Yep. Oops. Sorry. We just, we get really excited, guys. Sorry. I know. Like, we nerd out, and then we go on some, I think, hilarious tangents, but I'm also biased. V hilarious tangents. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, well, thanks for sticking with us through those epically long episodes. But yeah, this way we can do a little bit more research and go a little more in depth and, uh, Hopefully, it'll be a good idea. (laughs) It's going to be so great. And other news, I got the job. She did! I got the job. Guys, she's an assistant director now. What? Yes. What? But I have a month to move to another state, and I'm panicking, but it'll be fine. It'll it'll be, it's it's not going fine. It'll be fine. It's fine. I just did it. I lived. Yes. Well, my husband did it. I lived in a house with nothing in it for an extra month. But yeah, it happens. You know, yeah. you can do it. I'm pretty sure that's what's going to happen for like the first month or so. I'll be down there by myself and living in like a very barren space until we can close on a house and move all of our stuff down there. Plus my yeah. family. Yeah. I, uh, So we got orders, I think it was July, and then we had to be in San Antonio by September, but I was in grad school, so I couldn't leave. So I ended up finishing early, which I do not recommend for graduate school. So then I graduated on the 15th, and then I moved on the 16th. But yeah, I lived in like an empty house, and I had, we like bought a cheap ass refrigerator from somebody so we could take the actual fridge to this house, and then I just had like a chair (laughs) a couch and then I had a bed but yeah it was it was uh it it works just FaceTime a lot and yeah you know distance makes the heart grow fonder they say real talk (laughs) yeah Yeah. it it works it'll be fine so besides that I got to go to Texas this past weekend and hang out with Kina yeah she didn't oh, yeah. melt to death <laughs> oh my god I loved it it was so funny because like every day there was a hundred and sunny and then when I got back to my house it was pouring rain and 69 degrees which was ridiculous because it's Arkansas so I know yeah. I can't be- I can't even imagine that it's been so long since it was that cool here <laughs> right so much fun in Texas you should look at our Instagrams and see What all we did. It was so fun. I got to go see the Alamo like a real tourist. And I managed to not fall into the river at the Riverwalk in San Antonio. And (laughs) it is very concerning. Like I had legitimate anxiety about like (laughs) passing people because there's no railings, people. Mm. No railings. What the hell? That walkway is everybody's like, go to the Riverwalk. But you're walking on like two feet of concrete between you and a river yes. it's shocking oh to everybody <laughs> but yeah we I went to Austin. Yet to see somebody fall in we go like once a week and i'm just like and st patrick's day 
They eat like diet green. Everybody's hammered because it's like two dollar beer. And I didn't see a single drunk person fall in. I am right. disappointed, and because I'm disappointed means I'm gonna be the one that falls in, and then everybody be like, finally. So yeah, no. We know for a fact that if something weird is gonna happen, it's gonna happen to me. <laughs> Like, on my way back from Texas, I passed a an exit off the interstate, and then not even half a mile past it, my windshield wiper broke on my car in pouring rain on the interstate. So I had to, like, limp to the nearest exit, which was another five miles, in pouring rain. And it was so dumb. I'm like... In the rain, barefoot, mascara running down my face, trying to fix it enough to get home. It was so dumb. Like, if so, if anyone's going to fall into the river there, it's going to be me. Uh, we also went to Austin and saw Wine and Crime Live, which yes. was amazing. And we've decided we need to befriend them because we love them. And yes. uh, we we're probably like almost, like almost, not quite there, but a little bit stalkerish on how many times we tagged them on Twitter. Yeah, it was it was probably excessive, but I don't I don't care because I want to be best friends with them, mm-hmm. like so bad. So I don't feel that bad. And we we got to meet them, do the little meet and greet, and yeah! we got a picture for proof. Yes, we absolutely yeah. like geeked out, and we're so excited. So while we were in Austin, we had a cute little flapper photo shoot, and it was Julie Chris photo, and you should follow her on Facebook and Instagram. She is amazing, but even a cooler person. Like, we got to know her, and she is fucking fantastic. Yeah, she was so wonderful. She does haunted tours in Austin, and she took us to a place called the clay pit to do photos and it used to be a brothel. And I think we are like the only people that could genuinely someone tell us, Oh yeah. And over here in the corner, a woman was murdered and we're like, Oh my God, that's so cool. (laughs) It had like secret tunnels and shit. Like one tunnel went to the Capitol and they used to like smuggle in gold there. I was geeking out. It's like short circuiting a bit. It was probably very embarrassing for me, but. It was wonderful. No, she was amazing. And I like immediately decided that I was going to be BFFs with her and she just doesn't know it yet. So she does now. She listens. Woo! Yeah, we surprise! Love you. <laughs> but yeah, we did so much fun stuff. And now I'm like exhausted and haven't left my bed in several days. I'm like recording from bed. So I'm not going <laughs> to lie. It's fine. Uh, yeah, I've been trying to get back to the gym and all that. And I'm a. Uh, I have yet to hear about my job. They told me it would probably be two to three weeks, so I'm still waiting. And because I'm waiting, I'm getting increasingly more anxious. <laughs> so decided yep. I would go to the gym and try to burn some of that anxiety off. Because man, it's real. <sighs> the struggle is real. It is. It is. Oh, and we also, if you want to go check out Patreon, we oh, are. Yeah www.patreon.com slash historical AF pod. We've added new stuff. We have new tiers. We have our $2 and $5 like we did before, but now we've added a $10 that adds all that plus postcards from us and handwritten notes. And then you also get to choose one of our stories for the pod. And then we have a $15 tier that's going to add all that. Plus, you get a coffee mug with any of our images from our merch store. You get to choose. And then if you do $20, like if you really dig us, you get a tote bag on top of all of that. So definitely go check it out. It has so much content, you guys. I know we talk about it, but we have like drunk dives and we have book lists and bucket lists and just all kinds of stuff. We post something about pretty much every day. So yeah. Pretty much, Definitely, yeah. Uh, check that out. So, going to be wonderful. Woo! Drink. <laughs> nice. Oh, I'm drinking from my cool Spider Man glass that I got from the Far From Home movie. <laughs> oh man, it's is that so- already out? Yeah, it's a oh. cute little. Can you see it? It's a oh, like vintage Spider Man. Oh it's my very gosh. Cute. Nice. I really dug that movie. I'm a big Marvel nerd, but. Yeah, it was really good. <laughs> and then good. me and my sister got matching glasses because we're 
Double nerds. Aw, so. I would love that. Oh, when I went and ate at Joe's Crab Shack, they had a glass that had like the light up thing on the bottom. And I kind of want to go back and get it. I But I did get collectible tin can cups that says, if you love someone, give them crabs. <laughs> yeah. So that's my current favorite that. cup. That yeah. is amazing. And I support it wholeheartedly. <laughs> All right, guys. So want to want to do the do the damn thing hell yeah so we're talking about libraries this week we are and i know we've mentioned that we met at a library we did i'm an ex-librarian turned history nerd and ashley's just owning the library game right now super librarian (laughs) She's killing it. But yeah, I know we talk about libraries all the time, especially if you listen to like our extra AF episodes where we went on like the PSA about why they're awesome. Yes. And we recently got an email from somebody saying they joined like their local library because of us. So that made me so happy. Like I got a little verklempt about it because I was like, oh my God, we're making a difference. Because that's, that's what being a librarian is about. So yeah, we're, we're kind of a big deal. Yes, I love it. <laughs> Changing lives, bitches. Oh, something that we forgot to mention when we were in line at Austin, besides the fact that I ate a donut from a stranger, um, <laughs> we mentioned to the person next to us that we also have a podcast. And when she said, oh, what podcast is it? And we told her historical AF. She said, oh, I've heard of that. And I think my heart dropped to my butt because I was so excited. I almost cried. <laughs> A yeah, stranger I also short heard of us. I was like, I don't, I uh, can't compute. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> That's the first time that like a stranger has been like, oh, I've heard of that. So I was like, I legitimately almost cried. Yeah. And then at that same moment, we hear, what's up, bitches? We turn around, it's the wine and crime gals. So we were like doubly like overstimulated. We didn't know how to process all this awesome thing. real talk. But anyway, sorry, I just remembered <laughs> that. But yeah, so um, yeah, we're going to talk about libraries today and it's going to be super fun, but especially fun because we're in the new format where we only do three stories. All right. So do you want spooky or random first? Ooh, hmm. I think I want to go spooky. Okay. So, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica blog, which is apparently a thing that I didn't know was a thing, not either. Arkansas, yeah, Arkansas only has two haunted libraries. According to this blog, we know this isn't true because that's we've... incorrect. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So they claim that the Phillips County Library and Museum in Helena is haunted, which. I know somebody that works at the museum at Helena and he was telling me stories that they got this weird ass doll that they keep in a closet that's haunted. And he showed me a picture and I had nightmares for like a week. I'll show you a picture later. Okay, good. But the other one was Celine County Library. Which what? What? You have worked at and your husband still does. Also, fun fact, I have been in an article about the haunted Celine Library. Also, when I was Googling this, she, that showed up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but the one they consider the most haunted is not the building you worked at. Yep. So the library from 1967 to 2003, which is when I graduated high school, and this makes me feel very old, was actually a converted old movie theater. And it was called the Old Palace Theater. And the building frequently featured phenomena that made librarians suspect that a ghost was afoot. They heard phantom footsteps, paperback carousels rotating by themselves, which also happened at Layman. Books fell off the shelves, which also happened at the library (laughs) we worked at. And they claimed there was a self-operating photocopier, which I want to know what it was photocopying. Was it just nothing or was it just like a ghost butt? Because that's what I'm hoping (laughs) I hope it was a ghost butt, but I think it was just blanks, if I remember oh. correctly. All right. And then they also said that the book return door would slam shut. And then the last little bit here. They said once late night, the director, Julie Hart, heard a distinctive sound of a manual typewriter, which at this time, no library still had a manual typewriter. So spooky. But this is not the library I'm going to talk about. I just wanted to talk about it because you worked there. <laughs> Can I share something about that library real yes, quick? It's yes, terrible, okay. 
and I can't stop thinking about it. So that old building, the palace, the reason that the library is no longer there is because the roof caved in from the weight oh, of no. bird poop. What? Yes. The roof oh caved in from bird poop. So that building has been condemned for a really long time because the ladies who do the ghost hunts actually really wanted to go ghost hunt there, but it was like condemned and there was no way. Well, somebody locally within the last like month has just bought that building and they're now renovating it to become a restaurant, which is cool, but I can't stop thinking about the bird poop ceiling. Mm, That'd be a lot of bird poop to make a ceiling collapse. Yes, it was, uh, it was in the children's department and it collapsed. Oh, yikes. So yes, but anyway, go on. Oh, man. So you go to a librarian conference, basically every library is like, yeah, we're haunted. So I don't feel like there's only two in Arkansas, but, you know. Yeah. But that actual story is going to be about the Willard Library, which I heard about back in the day when, uh, what was it? Shit. Not Ghost Adventures. What was the other one that had the creepy lady with the, the girl from Poltergeist? Scariest Places on Earth? Yes, yeah, scariest places on earth. <laughs> they did a thing on this. And then I think Ghost Hunters and Ghost Adventures, everybody's been here. Nice. So it's one of the most well known haunted libraries. The Willard Library is located in Evansville, Indiana, and it was built in 1881 by William Carpenter, who is known locally as a pioneer of public charity. So it was a Victorian Gothic design, and it was two stories tall. It's a brick building, and it had a tower, and it had ornate window arches. It is the oldest library in the state of Indiana, so it contains a treasure trove of historical archives and genealogical materials. Plus, it's really hella haunted. So, one of the earliest and most famous encounters is this one on the Morning of 1937, the Willard Library night janitor made his rounds in the basement in order to stoke the coal furnace. It was to be the last night he worked in the library alone. Of course. Can you imagine, like, a library being so old that you have to have so many work nights just to put coal in the fire? I love it. It blew my mind. So at approximately 3 a.m., he made his way downstairs through the hall So to access the furnace area, as he made the short walk, he was startled to come face to face with a lady wearing a gray veil. She was bathed in a gray light that clearly illuminated her in the dark. He was so shocked at seeing her, naturally, that he dropped his light. As he bent down to pick up the light, he made note that her shoes were even gray. As he stood back up, he watched as the all gray lady disappeared before his eyes. He quickly made his exit and quit his job. <laughs> that very Yikes. <nice. laughs> I really appreciate how, like, color-coordinated the gray lady was, though. Right? Like a fashion statement. Yeah, I would have probably also quit. This was the first recorded sighting of the all-gray lady at Willard Library. And for the past 85 years, the gray ghost of Willard Library has been seen numerous times, mostly <laughs> by people who work there. <laughs> The most frequent reports come from the library employees and staff. Some are more unnerving encounters, one of which is in the elevator. Because one can simply not flee when they're scared. They have to complete the ride with her, trapped inside with a ghost. Thanks, I hate it. Yeah, do not like that. And, you know, if the library worked out, the elevator would, like, break all the time and you get stuck in there. So I can't imagine, like, Boom, ghost in there. You can't get out. And then it breaks and then you're stuck in there too. Oh, man. Do not want. (laughs) Yeah, nope. So there are several theories as to who this gray lady is. Many speculate that it could be someone from a local graveyard because library is pretty close to a graveyard. But one of the most popular theories is that she is Louise Carpenter, the daughter of the library's founder, Willard. In 1876, Willard Carpenter established a trust fund to see that a library was established in Evansville. And it would become a public library for the use of people of all classes, races, and sexes, free of charge forever. And that was a quote by him. Which, think about 1876, this is pretty a remarkable statement. Yeah, that's pretty progressive. Yeah. 
The land was deeded, and in 1877, construction began. Willard Carpenter died, though, in November of 1883, a year before the library was completed. It would open in 1885. Fortunately, Willard left a substantial portion of the estate to the library, leaving little, if anything, to his own family, which, as you can imagine, didn't bode well. (laughs) This caused a bit of stir, especially with his estranged daughter, Louise Carpenter. She maintained that her father was in a poor state of mind when he wrote his will and attempted to sue the library trustees. Yikes. Yeah. Louise failed, though, and lost any claim she may have had to any of the library's property, which was vast, including a lot of land. Many believe it to be Louise Carpenter, who haunts the Willard Library, still feeling pretty pissed off that she was left out of her father's will. According to a local paranormal investigator, Bill Miller, the ghost is not Louise at all. And this is a quote. If it was Louise, she would be ripping books off the shelves, he said. The lady in gray is gentle, nothing like that. He thinks that the lady is actually a woman who died in the canal behind the library long before the library was built. Lucille Warren, a popular parapsychologist, visited the library in 1985, which I was one year old. (laughs) As we calculate how old I am here. (laughs) She reported a very similar story. Because the woman was dressed in clothing that predated Louise Carpenter's era, she feels the woman was from an earlier time. Through her psychic perceptions, she felt that the woman drowned in the canal, possibly from a suicide. Which is really sad in itself. Yeah. I guess if you died, like, tragically, and then you're just hanging out at a library being real sweet, I guess that's kind of a place she has. She's at a place she likes. Real talk, that's something that came up in both of the library ghost hunts that I went to. Like, we asked, you know, is this, like, where you're hanging out in the afterlife? And, you know, it's probably a pretty nice place to be. Mm-hmm. You get to see all kinds of people. There's always a book to play with. Like, exactly. You get to see the same people every day. Yep. Aside from suddenly appearing and disappearing to people, the lady is said to turn on water and move objects around the library. People claim they smell perfume, they feel cold, they hear noises, they find that books and furniture have been moved, and some people claim that they feel someone touching their hair and earrings. They also say that sometimes they can find odd items left throughout the library. That feels like something that, like, patrons just do, period. Like, just leaving (laughs) odd objects, leaving the faucets on. Okay, so, like, when a library closes, most of us... You know, you do your closing task, but the last one is to go, you know, fix the shelves and put books back and, like, straighten everything up. Just imagine somebody, like, slacks and doesn't do that, and they're like, well, the ghost did that because I obviously straightened all those bookshelves the night before. Yeah, it's a real good cop-out, that one. (laughs) That's what I'm imagining. So you'd always, like, everybody should be on the floor, like, fixing everything, but you'd see somebody, like, hiding somewhere with their phone. So that's my guess. Big mood. (laughs) However, although the old gray lady is the library's paranormal star, there have been several other encounters with different entities inside the building's walls. It is known that there are at least two separate energies, as police attest to, because they have responded to several security alarm incidents, and they actually witnessed two ghosts in the upstairs window one time. Okay, gotta get a picture ready, because... This is the only time that I've done a spooky segment, and I saw a picture, and I was like, nope, 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 the fucking out of there. This one gave me the creeps, and I did not like it. The other ghost is said to be a shadow person or a dark mass. Several photographs have been taken within the library that show a dark mass, sometimes human-shaped, and other times seemingly without form, and I have sent it to you now. What? What? What the fuck? (laughs) <laughs> oh nope it is like yeah. literally someone crouched on the floor you can see feet and you can see freakishly long arms like it's crawling towards you but it's all black yeah no can't do that shit i don't like anything that's gonna be crawling at me like no and it's kind of see-through like it it is bananas because there's no way that this is a person yeah, A, There's no way. 
cleanse it with fire. That's the only way to be sure. And B, this, I know it's probably not because of the thickness of the books, but the height of the shelves makes me think that it's like a children's area, and that freaks me out even more. It is. It is the children's department. Okay. Ha ha. No. I, no. Mm, nope. All right. So several photographs of this have been taken within the library. The main photograph that I just showed you is taken in the children's department by the surveillance system. So this is just somebody looking at the security cameras and found that shit. No. Nope. No. Not happening. But a lot of this is people caught things like this because Willard has surveillance cameras that you can ghost hunt on. So you can go to their library website and you can look at these security cameras. But after seeing this, I don't want to. I don't want to see that. Especially real time. You know that that's there. No. No. If you see something, do you, like, call them and go, hey, I just saw a ghost on your camera, or do you just, like, leave it? They have a forum, (gasps) and you can be like, I saw this at this time, and you can, like, share. It's really cool. Oh, my God, I'm doing this later. Yes. Although there's some asshole that went in and is like, look at my faucets I'm selling, and they just completely flooded the whole forum with just, like, links to go buy shit. But, like, why a faucet? I I don't know. So... It is one in a series of pictures which show what looks to be a vaguely humanoid form crawling along the ground in the children's room. At the same time the images were taken, it was noted that a chair and stool were moved. Unfortunately, there's no sound to go with these stills, so there's no way to tell like if it made like a demon noise or something. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Pterodactyl scream. There's no <laughs> And it's still not known what or who the Willard shadow person is. But wait, there's more! During the mid-1970s, when the library was under construction, the Leap Librarian, a woman named Margaret Mayer, reported that the ghost went home with her. Her son didn't believe her until he saw the apparition himself. He witnessed a woman in a long gray dress climbing the staircase to the second floor of their house. When he went to investigate, she vanished before his eyes. After this construction was completed, the lady in gray returned to the library. Ugh. No! (laughs) So that's actually happened to me, and it is so scary. Yeah. No. You stay there. Right? Yeah. Stay, Stay at the library. Don't come home with me. It's very unsettling. Stay in your ghost lane. Yes. Fall shit home. I just need to rest. I don't like all this noise. I'm coming (laughs) home with you. But like, if she can follow you home, then that goddamn black thing, that black mask could follow you home too. That's a demon. I don't care. Yeah, that is a very valid point. No. No, no, no. I hope that me talking about this doesn't be like, come visit Kina. No, you stay there. (laughs) (sighs) <sighs> Back to this whole camera thing. So the Willard Library ghost cams are inspired by the question, is Willard Library actually haunted? It has become a fascinating and somewhat credible legend that drives thousands of people to search the library for remnants of lost spirits. The site is a virtual ghost hunting mecca. You can take a virtual tour of the library with Greg Hager, Willard Library's director. Libraryghost.com offers three cameras for your ghost hunting pleasure. The children's room cam, which where this creepy ass black Ugh. ghost mask thing was. There is a research room cam, which most of the pictures of the gray lady I saw was there. And then there's also a basement cam, which I didn't look at because that just sounds creepy anyway. Yeah. Yep. And they refresh every 20 seconds. Oh, okay. According to reports from visitors, some of the most frequent encounters with the legendary Lady in Grey have occurred in the reading room and the children's reading room. And she's also been spotted in the basement. No. Nope. (laughs) The library has been investigated by several organizations, including Mesa Multi-Energy Sensor Array, is what that stands for, TAPS, and other teams looking for ghosts. Oh, man. So I looked up the most recent stuff. So the Lady in Grey was reportedly sighted on August 10th, 2010 in the basement hallway by an assistant children's librarian. Imagine if you're like new too. Yeah. (laughs) 
<laughs> like nobody told me. <laughs> no. That was not in the new orientation. Yeah. I mean, but they have to know they're being recorded for the public. So I guess they would have to tell you that there's a ghost cam. Yeah, true. And then they would have to tell you, like, why there's a ghost cam. Oh, God. Is this illegal to record you without your knowledge? So yeah. you have to know. Yeah, I was wondering how they got around that because it's illegal to be record uh, to record someone without their knowledge, and within libraries we protect patron information, so mm-hmm. that includes their likeness without a waiver. I'm assuming they only have the ghost cams up when the library's not open because all um, the spotting I saw was like after hours. I didn't look okay. at the cameras because okay. they were uh, down for like maintenance or something whenever I was stalking, but. The ghost did it. The ghost did it. So psychics visiting the library in 2007 say they were able to verify that a ghost had been there. And paranormal investigative groups have brought in equipment designated to locate it. So many times you see like all these ghost shows, they go places and they're like, I didn't see anything. Every ghost people that go to this place find something. It's bananas. (laughs) It's like the Crescent Hotel. Every time one of these ghost places go there, they find something. So this is one of the places that I'm like, there's something to it if they catch something every time. Several library employees have reported seeing the ghost, including the woman we talked about earlier, Margaret Mayer. And then also Helen Cam, who is a library assistant, has publicly posted that she has seen things too. Huh. During a visit to the library, lecturers from the University of Southern Indiana say they saw a ghost peering into water. Can you imagine? You're there just to do a program and you see a ghost and you're just like, no, yep, I nope, did not I'm sign out. up for this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're probably like paid lecturers too. From my experience, you pay people to come talk. So I wonder if they're just like, I gotta go. Give me my check. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta get out of here. And then... Policemen that respond to security alarms spot ghosts in the upstairs windows pretty frequently. A library patron reported an encounter with the gray lady in the library elevator. And a local weathercaster also reported an encounter with the spirit. Cloudy with a chance of haunting, am I right? Huh? Huh? (laughs) Hundreds of people look for the gray lady every day in October during ghost tours sponsored by the library. 800 curious individuals attended the first tour in the late 1990s, which has become a popular annual event ever since. So you can actually go to willardghost.com and you can check the calendars for the next ghost tour. Ooh, yeah, definitely cash in on that. And it's probably the first library I've ever gone to their website and they have a tab for ghosts. Like, they're really rolling with it. Yeah. Oh, man. So they got a tab for ghosts and they got a tab for history and they kind of interlock and then they have a separate one for the ghost cams. So huh. not only are they just openly like we have ghosts or like here's an extra website because we have too much stuff to tell you. That's wonderful. I love that they're like leaning into it hardcore because I would too. Yeah. I think, especially now with the popularity of, like, ghost adventures and everything, I think it would be a mistake not to, because think of how many people are coming to that library. Even if it's just for ghosts, they're still there, and they're going to probably stay once they see everything else you're doing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. I mean, Layman, our first director, was like, there's no ghosts here. Nobody will come here if there's ghosts here. And then we had a ghost hunt, and it didn't scare anybody off. Yep. (laughs) People were lining up to go to those programs I had showing the ghost stuff. Yep, yeah. One of my biggest programs was showing the evidence from the ghost hunt at Selene, so. Yeah. Yeah. It was crazy. That was probably one of the most popular, too. And if you haven't heard the EVPs, we played some of them on the July Extra AF. What, what? Yes, and they are awesome. Shameless plug. (laughs) Listen to our stuff. Yeah, listen to all of it. Yeah, I want to go there. It's really pretty, too. So we'll post pictures. But it's, like, the most gorgeous building. Cool. It's got this beautiful... It kind of reminds me of that courthouse we saw in San Antonio with the spires and the brick. It's so pretty. Yeah, I am a sucker for a pretty library. That's where I would haunt. Mm -hmm. Oh, same. Totally. 
Or a museum. I think I might haunt a museum. Yes. Yeah, like I could some see weird that. like masks move. Yes, that would be so cool. <laughs> so when we were at Lehman, I worked at the old Argenta branch, which used to be a fire station, and I only worked there once. And as we were closing, the person that I was working with went to clean the bathrooms and I went out front to pull the like rolling sign in for the night. And as I came in, I heard someone walking across the floor, but apparently so did she. But neither of us was moving at the time that we heard these and we we're the only ones in the building. Oh, and we no. both got we both got incredibly creeped out. Ugh. And I was like, yeah, I'm never, never working at this branch again. I never worked at that branch. I did go to the new branch, was which was a post office. Yeah. And that place creeped me out. Like, the break room is where that guy committed suicide, and they had to patch up the bullet hole and stuff. It's creepy. Yes. The whole yeah. basement is... Mm, do not According like... According to the workers at the old branch, there was also a monkey that haunted the building, because when it was a firehouse, they had a pet monkey. <laughs> And it would, like, move the books in the children's area. But, yeah, so that's a thing that happened, apparently. Okay, I know monkeys are cute, right? But, like, Ghost monkey, story... not so much. <laughs> well, even monkeys as pets, you know? There's that one lady that had a pet monkey for years, and it was, like, her child. Yes. And then it ripped her face off. I just have, I have a lot of issues with pet monkeys because they will eat your face off. She was the first person to have a face transplant, and that was her, like, child. Ugh. It was actually her friend who got her face ripped off. It was an orangutan. Oh, yeah. There was another one that, her, her pet. But, like, every yeah. story of pet monkeys, they, like, attack. These are yep. rabid, wild animals. They're not domesticated. Like, yeah, don't do it. Yeah. No. It's terrible. I worked oh, yeah. at PetSmart in college. And one time this lady brought in her pet monkey. And mm. it would, like... She's like, look at my monkey. And it would, like, jump on your shoulder. And, like, but it was wearing a onesie, like a baby. And it okay. kept jumping on me. And it was, like, trying to kiss me. And I'm like, you're going to eat my face off. <laughs> it's after <laughs> my face. No, but it was super cute. But I was just like, is this the moment you're going to snap? <laughs> you're going to eat That's my face? Wonderful. Oh, it was scary. It was, it was, she had two of them. So it was like a white onesie and a purple onesie. And they were like hopping from employee to employee. And everybody's like, oh, little baby. And I'm like, mm -mm, nope. 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 I've seen that episode of yeah. Dateline. No. <laughs> nope. That's horrifying. <laughs> yes. Cool. Are you ready for my morbid story? I am. I will say, after three weeks of being horrifically depressing, this is like morbid light <laughs> yay like I appreciate it's a little that. weird so if you listen to last week's episode and you should we made <laughs> several references to hocus pocus and i happen <gasps> to love that movie Me um, too. and because of that and because while i was in texas i mentioned evil dead the musical to kina and talking about the song about the necronomicon there are two things in common between Hocus Pocus and Necronomicon. It's that there are books, there are magical books that are bound in human flesh. Ooh! Oh, so glad! I'm so glad you're doing this because I was really yes. hoping you would. <laughs> yes, I am. I'm fascinated by this. It's really creepy. So here lately, in the last like year or so, I've seen in the news where people are having after their death, they're having their tattoos cut off and preserved for their family members to be like hung on the wall in a picture frame or whatever. Yeah, I think I saw that too. I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> Which at first I was like, what the actual fuck? I'm taking those with me to the grave. But then the more I thought about it, it's kind of cool. I still don't think I'd do it, but I can understand why others would do it. I mean, I don't think I want like my if I ever have kids, my future grandchildren have my tramp stamp on the wall because that was like a 17-year-old mistake on my part. <laughs> I don't think I want that happening. And here lies Granny's tramp stamp. <laughs> but yeah, so I, I think it's like, fascinating. In my defense, I grew up, I'm a hillbilly, and nobody called it a tramp stamp until the wedding crashers came out. And then all of a sudden, my life was like over. <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, you're a tramp stamp. Yeah. Like, no. 
less it. Yeah, that's like the one place I won't get a tattoo because I don't want it to be said that I have a tramp stamp. So I think I got it in like 2001, 2002. And by then it was cool to have them. And then all of a sudden it took a turn and now I'm tramp stamped. Afflicted with a tramp stamp. (laughs) So books being wrapped in human flesh is called anthropodermic biblio oh my god i practiced this word and i still can't say it bibliopagy so bibliopagy itself is just book binding it's a synonym for book binding but when you th- throw the antho uh, anthropodermic in there it's bound in skin which okay. the anthro part is from athropos which means man or human so anthropodermic is human skin which you can also have books that are covered in animal skin. And I have a little bit about like the diff- how you tell which is which. Isn't leather technically animal skin? It is, yes. Okay. And it's referred to in the articles I found as human leather, which really creeps me out. <laughs> I don't like that. Because, you know, they have, like, those leather stores where you walk in and it smells amazing. And it's just, like, leather pants and motorcycle jacks- jackets and hats. And it's all leather. I imagine that with, like, human skin. and it no! could- <laughs> So what got me on this topic, besides us talking about stuff that involves human flesh books, is <laughs> that Harvard, yes, the school, the prestigious Ivy League school, has recorded three books in their collection that are bound in human skin. Ooh. And I was like, okay, what the fuck is up with this? But apparently this was a thing that happened back in the day, kind of like to keep souvenirs, kind of like cutting a lock of someone's hair was a thing. Okay, so Harvard has over 15 million books in its collection. It's impossible to know how many books are actually bound in human skin, but, and like, there is testing they could do, like DNA testing and stuff, but it could damage the books, plus in the, like, tanning process of the skin, just like with cow leather, you lose a lot of the DNA, people who have touched the book, you could pick up their DNA when doing testing, and it can damage the book. Wait, so there's probably books out there that are people, but you can't tell that they're people. So people are probably touching people, thinking it's cow. Yep, exactly. Ah! No, I don't like that. Right, yeah. It is kind of mortifying. I so I just imagine from TV and movies that it would just be, like, undoubtedly human. But Yeah, like, you yeah. just look at it and go, that's definitely Bob. Like, Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so the article I read, I'm just going to read this part verbatim. So, although the first looks like an average text, like there aren't bits of hair and teeth jutting out and setting it apart from the other text, practicum, oh God, practicarum, uh, questionum, circa leges regius is relatively unique, being that it has a particularly gruesome story surrounding its creation. So, here's what I love about this book. On the final page, there is a... T- Inscription in purple cursive that says, The binding of this book is all that remains of my dear friend Jonas Wright, who was flayed alive by the... Ah! Oh, God. What's that word? By the Wavama on the fourth day of August 1632. King Mabisa did give me the book, it being one of poor Jonas's chief possessions, together with ample of his skin to bind it. Rest in peace. Uh, yeah okay. just be like rest in peace doesn't make that okay <laughs> right flayed alive oh my god oh yeah my god. so dude was flayed alive and um then the person who had him flayed was like here's this book and also here's your friend's skin and uh, then he was like i'm gonna put these two together no so why oh. yeah so that reminds me of Bartholomew, that yes. the Bible, who got flayed. And I know, like, we've talked about body works that exhibit in the past, but they actually have somebody that's been flayed holding their skin like that. And that just yeah. ugh, haunts my nightmares. I- Real talk. And then one of the other books is an 1880 text called Des Destines de... That's a word I can't pronounce. Yame, I think. Let's... 
guys, I'm real white and real American. So is this Latin? No, it is what actually is it? it's a collection of essays by on the nature of the human spirit written by French poet Arsene oh. Husaye. So I just completely butchered that. But you know, let's just move on. So <laughs> a note came with this book when they acquired it that said that the binding comes from, and I quote, the back of the unclaimed body of a woman patient in a French mental hospital who died suddenly of apoplexy. Oh, my God. Yeah. So this is literally the skin of a mental patient. So I'm I'm assuming just from like the research I did for my thesis, most people in mental hospitals were just thrown in pauper's graves. So yep. instead of throwing her in a pauper grave, they decided to just turn her into a book. Pretty much. Like just, yeah. Oh my God. And <laughs> one of the friends of this poet justified using human skin to bind it by saying a book on the human soul merited that it was given a human skin. Oh. Mm, not so much. Mm. I think people can use their imaginations. Like, yeah. we can read some really deep things about souls and not need people's skin. Right. So, yeah. And, like, I don't know if you can see it because I've got my, my light off. But here's a picture of one of the human skin books. Like, it's really gross and looks, like, all wrinkly and puckered. And it's just really creepy. <sighs> that just looks like really bad leather. You can't it even... does. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> Those are the books that are at Harvard. So let me talk about a few, like the history behind it and a few other things. So there's a reference to a book bound in human skin found in the travels of Zacharias Conrad von Uffenbach. He wrote about his visit to Bremen in 1710. And he basically said, we saw a book, Malari Manuale Preparation, oh my God, Preparationis Ad Mortem. And there seemed to be nothing remarkable about it. And you couldn't understand why it was here until you read in the front that it was bound in human leather. This unusual binding, the like of which I had never before seen, seemed especially well adapted to this book. Dedicated to more meditation about death, you would take it for pigskin. Thanks, I hate it. So, Uh, I mean, I love books. I do. I don't want to be one. I feel like (laughs) I wouldn't hate it. My family would hate it, but I wouldn't hate it. So during the French Revolution, there were also rumors that a tannery for human skin had been established at Modon outside of Paris. The Carnivalet Museum owns a volume containing the French Constitution of 1793 and the Declaration of Rights of Man. And it's described as passing for being made in human skin imitating calf. So this is actually a lot more common than I was expecting it to be. So the rights of man is written on man. Yep, pretty much. That's very symbolic, I imagine. Yeah. Wait, where did they get the skin? Was it just like all the people who they were hacking heads off? They're like, we got all these extra bodies lying around. Let's just turn them all into books. That is a very good question. I don't remember seeing that. Let me see if it's in. French Revolution was. I mean, the whole reason they created the guillotine was to kill people faster and more efficiently. <laughs> so they yes. had a lot of dead people around. Very, very true. I was trying to see if it was later. Because I, I also have examples of other books that are bound in human skin. But I don't. Yeah, it's not in these notes. What the French, whore? Okay. Um, <laughs> anyway. That's my new favorite saying ever. <laughs> what the French, whore? Yes. so like the books at harvard there are surviving examples of human skin bindings that have been commissioned performed or collected by medical doctors which the reason that they're mostly seen for medical doctors is because they have the most access to get cadavers to get this skin oh okay What's really weird to me, and one of my favorite stories out of all this, is that sometimes the cadavers are actually executed criminals. And there is the case of John Horwood in 1821, and then William Corder in 1828. The Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh preserves a notebook bound in the skin of murderer William Burke after his execution. And he also, after he was executed, he was publicly dissected. By Alexander Monroe in 1829. Oh, wow. So, yikes on bikes. And apparently all three of these men were killed by hanging. And then flayed after they were hung. So, 
what I love the bow the the most the most is that one of the most famous is James Allen. He made a confession on his deathbed in prison about the uh, murders that he committed, and his confession was turned into a book called The Highwayman, Narrative of the Life of James Allen, alias George Walton. And then when he was dying, he asked for a copy to be bound in his own skin to be presented to a man he once tried to rob and admired him for his bravery. Oh, wow. Also, I said he's a murderer, and that's wrong. He was actually a thief. I don't know why I said that. Moving well, on. So, a true crime documentary. So everybody's yes. a murderer. Yeah, basically, I just assume everyone has murdered someone. <laughs> so, another thing, which this, like, the more I think about it, the more I'm horrified and love it at the same time. Another tradition, which doesn't have as much supporting evidence, but I like it, is that books of erotica being bound in human skin. Wow, I would not have expected that. So you get that full skin on skin contact. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I understand the occult, but I don't think I've ever thought about erotic books being made out of people. I mean, yeah. I guess it makes sense, but yeah, I don't know. But yeah, like occult books I understand and I think that's because we grew up with stuff like hocus pocus and all of that, but yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> A Netflix show is so good. <laughs> yes. Yeah, like seeing a warrior princess playing a demon. It's amazing. Oh, oh man. Love it. Bless it. Uh, but yeah, so the Newberry Library, Newberry Library in Chicago owns an Arabic manuscript written in 1848 with a handwritten note that it is bound in human skin, though it is the opinion of the conservation staff that the binding material is not human skin, but rather highly burnished goat. Oh. Yeah. Okay. There is a French or a book by French astronomer astron- astronomer Camille Flammarion, which was from 1877, and it's supposedly bound in the skin donated from a female admirer. Hmm. That's a weird way to show your devotion, but okay. To each their own, I guess. Yeah, real talk. So, the National Library of Australia holds a 19th century poetry book with the inscription, Bound in Human Skin, on the first page. And the binding was performed before 1890 and identified as human skin by pathologists in 1992. Mm -hmm. There's an exhibition of fine bindings at the Grolier Club in 1903 included in a section of bindings and curious materials, three editions of Holbein's Dance of Death, in 19th century human skin bindings. Mm. Those two, or two of those belong at, to the John Hay Library at Brown University. There's another copy of Dance of Death in the 1856 edition offered at auction by Leonard Smithers in 1895. And there's an 1842 edition at the Florin Abeles Library, or the personal library of uh, Florin Abeles. And it was offered as au- at auction by Piazza of Paris in 2006. Mm-hmm. And then uh, book binder Edward Hertzberg describes the Monastery Hill bindery having been approached by an army surgeon with a copy of Dance of Death with the request that we bind it in a piece of human skin, which he had brought along. Wow. So, like, if you can't come up with your own human skin, you know, store-bought's fine. It's fine. <laughs> But yes, so a portion of the binding and the copy of Dale Carnegie's Lincoln the Unknown that is part of the collection of Temple University's Charles L. Bloxon collection. This is yikes. So it was taken from the skin of a Negro at a Baltimore hospital and tanned by the Jewel Belting Company. Oh, no. So here's, here's my question, and I had to look it up. How do you know if the book you're holding is human skin? So... To identify human skin bindings, this has been attempted by looking at the pattern of the hair follicles, which apparently, did not know this, human skin compared to calf or sheep or goat or pig says that, the stuff I read said that the hair, the spacing of the hair follicles is different, Mm -hmm. which I guess makes sense the more I think about it, but that's very subjective. And this is made harder by the distortion in the process of treating leather for the binding. Like I said earlier, you can test the DNA, but 
It can be destroyed when skin is tanned. It degrades over time. It can be contaminated by human readers. They can use testing like peptide mask fingerprinting and matrix-assisted laser desorption or ionization, which is what they've used to identify others. But a tiny sample, to do this, you have to extract a tiny sample from the book's covering and then use that sample to analyze the collagen that is in a mass spectrometer to identify the variety of proteins which are characteristic of different species. But here's the problem. Especially archivists, they don't want you cutting a piece of their book out. Oh, yeah. So a lot of this stuff is just going to be shrouded in mystery. So the historical uh, medical library of the College of Physicians in Philadelphia, they have five of these books bound in human skin. And this was confirmed by the peptide mass fingerprinting in 2015. Mm -hmm. And three of the five books was actually bound in the skin of one woman. So, like, she made an anthology. Oh, wow. Or a series, I guess. So, it's actually the largest confirmed collection of anthropodermic books in one institution. Huh. And the Muter Museum, which we talked about in our museum episode, is the place that you can see these books on display now oh cool yes so there's a ton and what really gets me is that a lot of these places it's like yeah they've got a couple human books but because it's kind of like hard to really test books there could be a lot more books bound in human skin that just are not are just like sitting there not completely known yet so that really fascinates me So here's a few of the confirmed examples. They're at Brown University. There is a book by Andreas Vesalius from 1568. And then there's the several copies of Dance of Death. There's another book, and those are also at Brown, as well as this book called Mademoiselle Mademoiselle Durad, My Wife by a Adolf Bellot, which is the English translation of this book from 1870, but this book was bound in 1891. So those are four at Brown, and then there's the ones at the College of Physicians at the Muters Museum. There's quite a few at that museum. Okay, and then there's a book in the French Private Collection by Edgar Allan Poe, The Gold Bug, that may or may not be human skin. But It says that it's brown leather-backed marbled boards, raised bands, decoration of a gold bug descending front, the eye socket of a skull above and cross-sickled, crossed sickle and shovel, decoration on spine, marbled in paper, and top edge gilt. So there's a whole bunch of books out there that, like, more than I'm comfortable thinking about being out there with human skin. Yeah, I don't think that, I mean, I knew that it existed, but I didn't think it was this common. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, like, what you see the most, and because, you know, I like I like looking at it in the media and all of that. You see it the most, you know, Hocus Pocus and Evil Dead. I mean, there's been in Supernatural, the show, there's been uh, several references, video games, mostly, like, things that you encounter books on the occult. You see that a mm-hmm. lot. Yeah. Uh, But yeah, so it's just like, it's so fascinating to me. And that's, I mean, that's all I really have on it. But it's just, it's so weird. And I can't decide if I would be creeped out to find out a book I had was bound in human skin. Or if I'd just be like, that's a cool artifact to have. I don't know. It's just weird. I think it's really interesting. I guess I was the same. I just assumed it was all like a cult type. Yeah. And I don't know, in my head, I was thinking, like, medieval Europe, but you listed things all over the world. This is not just a specific area or specific time. This is a pretty wide, a broad area of history that many cultures all partake in. That's crazy. Right, yeah, and, like, it would not surprise me at all if this was still a thing that was going on. I mean, like you said about the tattoos, it'll probably be, like, the new thing. Like, I want to be a book when I'm dead. Oh, yeah. Maybe that's what I'll do with my tattoos. Yes. (laughs) Yes. I love it. I love it. So, yeah. yeah. 
those are those are the human book bindings. I enjoyed that. All right, so I'm going to do my funny, which was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be to yes. find something funny about libraries. <laughs> ah, so it was a challenge, but I think, I mean, it might not be as funny as my butt, butt plug was <laughs> last week. I thought that was hilarious, but we're going to talk about the New York Society Library. Ooh. So in 1754... Before America was America, when there was no library in the city open to the public, the New York Society, a group of six civic-minded individuals, formed the library in the belief that a subscription library, which anyone could join in offering a broad range of books, would be very useful as well as ornamental to the city. It opened in a room in the old city hall on Wall Street facing Broad Street and for a century and a half until the founding of the public library system in 1895 was known as the City Library. During the Revolution, the library's books were looted by the British soldiers, boo, that were occupying Manhattan. Some were torn up to make waddling for rifles and others were sold for rum. Okay, that's oddly specific, but okay. I mean, your girl likes rum, but I don't think I would loot a library to pay for my rum. After the war, a few books that had been stored in St. Paul's Chapel in Lower Manhattan were recovered, and in 1784, others were found through advertisements. So the thing about that, they put an advertisement in the paper being like, we want our books back, and people (laughs) actually brought them back. Nice, how very noble. Right? This was a long time ago when people yeah. really yeah. cared. <laughs> True. Uh, in 1789, the library reopened in its previous quarters in the old city hall. In 1789 and 1790, when the New York when the New York, when New York was the nation's capital and Congress occupied the building, then renamed Federal Hall, it served effectively as the first library of Congress. Oh cool. That we've just gone up to even more big deal. Hell yeah. It was a big effing deal that was used by the founding fathers of the United States. But this is what brings me to the funny. In 2010, librarians in the New York's oldest library uncovered a surprising borrower with overdue books. Oh God. George motherfucking Washington. Nice. The first president of the United States of America borrowed two books from the New York Society Library in 1789, but failed to ever return them. Damn it, George. Adjusted for inflation, he has since racked up over 300,000 U.S. dollars, which is 195,000 pounds, in fines for being 220 years late. (laughs) Guys, I don't think you're going to see that money. The New York Society Library says, and I quote, it will not pursue the fine. It would simply like its books back. (laughs) Wow. It's been over 200 years. I mean, I guess you could pick your battles. You're not going to get the money. He's he's long dead. Yeah, but like, are they going to put the, I mean, if they got them back, would they put them like on exhibit or would they just like, oh God, what is it? like phase them out of the collection because you know at everywhere library i've worked at if the book hasn't served for three years it gets weeded yeah so i think i go into that a little bit how they found out that it was ever due because it was kind of like a nobody realized it until 2010 um oh and i found out he died okay he died on december 14 1799 at mount vernon but he died of a throat infection and i don't think i ever knew that I didn't either. I don't know what I thought he thought he died of, but I was not expecting that. Yeah, yeah, I did not know that. Because as soon as I thought about it, I'm like, he's not going to get the books back. He's dead. And then I was like, I don't think I know how he died. But yeah. That's, uh, he famously never told a lie. So I guess in this instance, he just openly gave no fucks about returning these books. <laughs> what were the books, you may ask? I was hoping for something like Karma Sutra or something fun. Yes. But- I was disappointed. Damn. On October 5th, ni- er, 
1789, the first president borrowed two books from what was then the only library in Manhattan, The Law of Nations, a dissertation on international relations, and a volume of debate transcripts from the Britain House of Commons. Okay. So, I mean, at least he was using it for work. Yeah, true. I mean, he's more well-read than some of the presidents we've had. (laughs) George Washington did not even bother to sign his name in the borrower's ledger. Bastard. An aide simply scrawled president next to the title to show that he's taken them. (laughs) Wow. The two items were due back a month later, but were never returned and have been accruing late fees ever since. Librarians uncovered the misdemeanor as they were digitizing the library's ledger from that time. Huh. So nobody knew until they were like, we need to finally digitize us. That's, that's a huge thing in libraries right now, digitizing everything. So I'm sure they were quite shocked. <laughs> yeah. To uh, find that George Washington was one of the ones that owed them money. Sadly for fans of the 18th century political literature, they appear to have vanished. But representatives from Mount Vernon formally presented the library with another volume of the one missing, uh, of one of the missing books, The Law of Nations, by Emir de Vatel. So, the other one's lost forever, apparently. But at least they got one book back. Yeah, true, true. I'm sure in my head, thinking of how this stuff works, that the librarians were like, hey, you got these books, we want them back. And Mount Vernon's just like, we're not going to dig through all this shit. We'll just get you a copy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I hope it had the same ISBN. <laughs> I'm assuming they probably have it somewhere. But yeah. Like every museum has like a storage that you probably don't even know what's all in there. Every, yep. like some places I've been, they have boxes, stuff they haven't been able to even catalog yet because they just have so much. So yeah, I'm sure they're cool. like, we're not going to do that here. Yeah. yeah. So just for fun, I looked up some other huge ass fines. <laughs> <laughs> the world's largest fine for an overdue book that was paid was $345.14, which is 203 pounds. The amount was owed for two cents a day for a poetry book that is called Days and Deeds. And it was checked out of Kiwani Public Library in Illinois, USA in April of 1955. Oh, wow. Although the book was due back in April 19th of 1955, the person that checked it out's daughter found it in the house 47 years later and then presented the library with a check, which also, that's really nice of her to be like, here's the money. Most yeah. people would be like, mm, my mom had it, not my, not my problem. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no. I, like, I think I'd be in that camp. And at first when I saw, th- this is the Guinness Book World Records for p- largest paid. Wow. And when I read that, I was like, I saw bigger fines at my library. <laughs> I was just thinking, the like, the highest I've ever seen, I had a guy call and was like, I need to check on my uh, fines and see how much it is so I can pay it off and start using the library again. And I was like, yeah, no problem. And when I pulled it up, it was like over $2,000. Yeah. And I was like, yikes. (laughs) I know that I saw like at least 600 or more when I was looking up stuff. But yeah, this is the largest one ever paid. That's nuts. So the real book about snakes by James Sherman was loaned from the Champaign County Library in Urbana, Ohio. It was 41 years overdue, and whoever turned in this musty old field guide declined to reveal their name, but lest anyone question the man's honesty, he also left the following note. (laughs) Sorry I've kept this book so long, but I'm a really slow reader. (laughs) Oh, man. At least he's honest. I have enclosed my fine of $299.30 for 41 years at two cents a day. Once again, my apologies. Oh, wow. That's so honest and sweet. That I is. Love it. <laughs> Man, I want to be like that when I'm older. Right? So, The Adventures of Pinocchio by Carlo Collodi. Is that how they say it? I don't think uh, I ever knew Pinocchio. I didn't Collodi. either. Let's anyway, go with that. It was loaned from the Rugby Library in Warwick, England, and it was overdue for 63 years. 
Oh, wow. The item found its way back during the eighth day of Fine's amnesty period. <laughs> oh, my God. Shield- that's amazing. Which shielded the guilty patron from the 4,000 pound penalty, which would be about 6,500 US dollars. And this is a quote. It's amazing to think how much the library has changed since that book was taken out in 1950, said the librarian Joanna Girdle. So that's fun. Yeah, if you have a book that's got like thousands of fines, slip it in during the amnesty day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's that's a that's like really smart. Mm-hmm. And a lot of libraries do that now. Yeah, and a lot of libraries also do food for fines where instead of paying it, you can give them like non perishable items that they can donate. But that's a lot of canned goods. That is a lot. That was a uh, hefty, hefty fine there. Yes. So the picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde was loaned from Chicago Public Library in Chicago, Illinois. It was 78 years overdue. Wow. Arlene Hoffman. Vision found a rare edition of this novel nestled among her late mother's personal effects and vowed to set things right. This is a quote. She kept saying, you're not going to arrest me, right? <laughs> we're called the marketing director, Ruth Led- Ledmister at the time. And we said, no, we're just happy you brought it back. <laughs> that is wonderful. I love that's just so sweet. <laughs> yes, that's so sweet. And I love that it was Dorian Gray because like he's immortal. Sorry, spoiler. So... <laughs> It's not like they had to be in any hurry to read yeah, it. Yeah, I just think it's so sweet. You probably have like an older lady whose mom died being like, please don't arrest me. My mom didn't know what she was doing. Yes. Oh, my God. The number of like notes we would get in books or like checks for like a dollar that were like, I'm so sorry. This is late. But from like little old ladies yeah. was so cute. Yes, it's so adorable. I always loved it when we got letters. <laughs> yes, yes. We'll hide them in books. Yeah, nope. well, that's my that's my funny. It's really hard to find something hilarious about libraries, but it is. Yeah. I'm not gonna lie. For next week, it was hard to find something for weird. Yeah. So we're gonna take a little different turn, but yes, that is so cool. <laughs> oh my gosh, I love it. And it just makes me, I have like a little warm feeling now with all these little old people being like, I'm sorry, here's a note and a check. Yeah. Just, you know, people take their libraries seriously. I love that we went from like, uh, <laughs> these books are made of skin to like, little old ladies are sweet. That's <laughs> true. Yeah, we always take a turn here. Yes. <laughs> At Historical AF Pod. Yeah. But yeah, so cool. So that's our new format. Next week, we will continue on with libraries. Three yeah. more stories. It'll be awesome. Next week, we'll have random, weird, and... What's your other uh, word? Uh, <laughs> historical! Yes, historical. Yes. Uh, I know what we're doing. I do. Look, <laughs> I'm lucky to be awake right now, so <laughs> don't hold me to being like an intellectual. All right, guys, so definitely check out patreon.com slash historical AF pod to check out our new tiers. And if you want extra content, definitely, definitely, definitely sign up. And we will uh, love to have you as part of our little Patreon family. Yes, and if you're planning on storming Area 51 soon and need some alien merch, we uh, we have some cool stuff on our merch site. And you can do you can access that at shop.spreadshirt.com slash historical AF pod. Yes, we need you to have your photo taken as you're being tackled by the Air Force wearing your poppin' wheelies in my space helicopter shirt. We need yes. this to happen. Yes. Or if you want to get the shirt that says it is never aliens and take a picture of yourself with an alien, we will we will send you something. I don't know. We'll have to send it to you in pri- prison, but <laughs> We'll do it. We will do it. I will put money uh, in your commissary. Yes. I am living for the Area 51 memes right now. And everybody's like, me, when I take home my pet from you know, Area 51. I'm loving it so much. I'm a oh. little concerned that it's gone from I'm going to storm Area 51 to I'm going to clap alien cheeks. Like, why does it go to I'm going to have sex with aliens? Yeah. It's, it's, it's a little weird. It's a little concerning. And, you know, being... That I'm a spouse of an Air Force person. All my Air Force friends are all like, mm, they're not playing. 
They, yeah. They will tackle you, if not shoot you. So be careful out That's there okay. with your military raids. Yeah, Although, all these people are literally people who, like, can't even call to order a pizza because they're so anxious. They're not going to go to Area 51. Let's just be real. But if you do, go to our shop and get some awesome alien merch. Absolutely. We are not condoning raiding a military base. We are condoning that you buy alien merch. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And also, please, please, please follow us on social media. We are Historical AF Pod on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I forgot what Twitter was for a second. It's okay. Yeah, I, I'm completely blanking out. But yeah, so go follow us. Have fun this week. And we will be back next week. Yes. And we will put up, we just drew for the winner for the merch contest. Oh, yeah. And uh, that will be up on YouTube. And we will share it on all the social media. So Yes, it'll be amazing. Okay. All right, guys. We love you. We love you. Have a great week. Bye. Bye.